Now, my text tonight is taken from Luke chapter 12 and verse 51. Luke chapter 12 and verse 51. And I'm only going to read the one verse. Luke chapter 12 and verse 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Now my subject tonight is entitled The Purpose of Christ Coming into the World. For the past few weeks we have looked at the subject of why Christ came into the world. And here's a very simple question. Why did he come? And we have looked at that question. And we have discovered while it's a simple question. It's got a very sublime and complete answer. That there's many parts to it. Now thank the Lord we're not left to conjecture or speculation. Or give our opinions as to why we think he come. Remember what he said in John 10 and 10, I am come that you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. He said in Mark 2, 17, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said in Mark 5, 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. He said in John 12 and 46, I am come as a light unto the world, that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. He said in John 7 and 28, ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true. And here we have Luke 12 and 51 that I've quoted in your hearing already. It ties into uh, Mark 10 and 34, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. Now you can see from all these references I quoted, It's very easy to ask the question, why did he come? Well, here's the answer. The answer is sublime and complex. We we take into our mind the word of God. And by these references, we begin to get a fuller picture. Uh, Two weeks ago, we looked at the praise of his coming from Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. Last week, we thought about the presentation of his coming. Using the words, I am come, we thought of his wonderful coming. We we thought of his calling. We thought of his challenge. We thought of his commission. Now tonight we're moving on, and I want to look at this one particular reference. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Look at verse 49. I am come to send fire in the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? I want us to think tonight of three simple things. The world's view of Christ's coming. Look at the words. Suppose ye that I am come. Here's the world's opinion. Here's the world's conclusion. Here's the world's thinking. Remember he says in a corresponding reference, think not that I'm come to send peace in the earth, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. Think of the word think. It involves the mind. There's a process of thought going on. And you see, the world's view is very simple. If we go to them and ask them tonight, I'm thinking of an ungodly world of unconverted men and women, and ask them, why did Jesus Christ come? (coughs) They would suppose and think that he came to bring peace on the earth. That's what he says. Look at your Bible. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth. That's the world's view. That's the thinking of the unconverted, the ungodly person. Now, now what did he mean when he said, suppose ye that I am come to bring peace or give peace or send peace on the earth? The answer is very simple. It's a, a political, it's a social peace. In other words, Jesus is a unifier of the people. He, he's going to, to, to bring everyone together. So that everyone can get along. Isn't it true that there's no peace on the earth at the present time? 
You only have to listen to the news, listen, read up in the newspaper. But the thinking of the world is, let Muslim and Hindu, Roman Catholic, Protestant, let them all be brought together so that everyone can get along. And who can unify them? Who can do that? But Jesus. Now I want to tell you, the world's view is that Jesus will bring a political and social peace into this world of disorder. Now we have already looked at the reference to peace in Luke chapter 2. Remember in the verse 14, a passage that Alan read to us. I preached on it three weeks ago. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And, and here's Jesus, and he's saying, Suppose ye that I'm come to bring peace on the earth. Or think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. In other words, I am not come to bring a political and social peace that, that unites people together so they can get along. And then people look at that and say, well, wait a wee minute, there's a contradiction in the Bible. On the one hand, and on earth peace. And, and here's Jesus and he's saying, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I have to say tonight, there's no errors, there's no contradictions in the Bible. We've got to rightly divide the word of God. Remember, if you think back, Luke 2, 14, I told you this is a reference on an earth peace. It's a reference to peace with God. I talked about those that had no peace with God. I talked about those that had a false peace. And I also closed with thinking about a genuine peace. Peace with God is genuine. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can have peace with God tonight. You can have sins forgiven. You can know you're in a right relationship with the Lord. And even in times of trouble and times of difficulty, you can have the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. It's a reference to a personal peace. Peace through the blood of Christ's cross. Christ is the Prince of Peace. But this other reference to peace, Luke 12, 51 Matthew chapter 10, 34 is a reference not to a personal peace for the individual, but for a political peace, but for a, 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 a peace that has to do with social order. You see, there are those that tonight believe that Christ is a, a pacifist. And here's this verse, and I have to tell you it's in the context of the persecution of the church. When the preacher goes out in the name of Christ, in the name of him who's the Prince of Peace and preaches that you can have peace with God and you can have the peace of God. And then people begin to discover as they listen to the preacher that there's not going to be a political peace in the world. And I wish that someone would tell Barack Obama that. And I wish someone would tell David Cameron that. And the United Nations need to hear it. There's not going to be a political peace in this earth. Because Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to send peace in the earth, but a sword. And you see, those preachers that preach about the person and work of Christ, those preachers that say that the Bible is the infallible and the inerrant word of God, and we believe in the doctrine of the incarnation, great as the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, and we uphold the Bible teaching and the virgin birth of Christ, and we believe in the blood atonement, and that Christ was absolutely sinless, and um, the, we, we believe that uh, Jesus was raised bodily again from the dead, uh, and we believe that this is sinful, whether it's homosexuality or, or drunkenness or murder or theft or, or, or whatever, that this is wrong uh, because it's contrary to the law of God. We're going to hear a reaction. And here's the reaction of the world. That's your view. Uh, and you're entitled to it. You can hold it. But it's not my view. Uh, and of course they go further and they say, but we don't want you to preach it. And if you preach an exclusive a way of salvation we'll criticize you and we'll condemn you 
You see, the world tonight wants a Christ that won't condemn anyone. Let me illustrate. When Christ was on earth, he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he cast out devils, he raised the dead. And as long as he did that, he was okay. His miracles were great. They got a thumbs up. Well done. We're happy. We're thrilled. And then he started to preach. Now, on the one hand, he's getting the praise of men. They're they're saying, this is wonderful. We have no objection to this. Then he begins to speak about the truth about himself. Who am I and why did I come? And he begins to apply it to their conscience. I'm the son of God. I'm the saviour of the world. You're a sinner and you need my salvation. And when he speaks about sin and he speaks about salvation and speaks about heaven and hell, then they discover then the, the animosity and the wrath of the human heart rising up. There's many today has a Jesus that's not of the Bible. A Jesus that's not of God. They have another Jesus. Another spirit energizes them. Another gospel. And when you tell them what you're saying isn't right, it's not according to the Bible, then you're labeled a Bible bigot. You're being branded as someone who's intolerant. We're told you're promoting views that are causing a division. And of course, I want to say tonight, let's not expect the world to applaud you for saying you're Christ and you belong to him and you stand for the truth. Because that's not the kind of Christ that the world wants. The world wants a Christ that unites us all. A Christ that will not condemn anyone. A Christ that will bring a political peace. A Christ that will have social justice for all. A Christ that will not make people feel uncomfortable. Give me a Christ that makes me comfortable in my sin. Whether it's the homosexual or or the drunkard or the murderer or the thief. A Christ that promotes understanding and acceptability for all no matter what you believe or what you stand for. You see, that's the world's view of Christ's coming. And that's what Jesus is getting at in these two verses. Suppose ye that I am come to send peace or to give peace on earth. Now let's think very quickly of the words view of Christ's coming. We said last week, think of the words, I am come. And we'll isolate that. Isn't that a wonderful message? I am come. Isn't that what the birth of Christ is all about? It's a heralding forth of a message. He has come. He came to where we are sinners. He came into our fallen sinful world. Jesus, or God the Father, didn't say uh, to sinful men and women, you try and climb up here to heaven to get to me. He didn't say to them, well, you've got to pass the test to prove yourself that you're worthy of heaven. He didn't say you've got to pay so much. He didn't say you've got loads of works righteousness to do to get in. And if your works righteousness outweigh your sins, you'll be okay and you'll be happy. That's what men think. But that's not the teaching of the Bible. The Lord Jesus came into the world. He took a human body. He became a real man, a man of flesh and blood to where we are, that that he might live a sinless life, that he might go all the way to the cross and die an atoning death. And as Joseph was told by the angels, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And this is a wonderful message. And this is in the word. And it's the greatest miracle in the world, as we said this morning, the miracle of miracles. Jesus Christ was born in God's appointed way. Isaiah 7 and 14. Behold a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. God was true to his word. Isaiah 700 years before Christ came said that. And it was fulfilled by the coming of Christ into the world. Jesus Christ was born of women. Naturally. But he was born of woman only. That's supernatural. He was born in God's appointed place. Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. Mary was expecting a baby. 
then all the world is going to be taxed. And Joseph, because he he belongs to the house and lineage of David, has to go to Bethlehem, the house of David, to be registered for that taxing. And they have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You can hear Joseph saying to Mary, it'll be okay. We'll get there and back again. And the Bible tells us, and it came to pass in those days when they were there in Bethlehem, that, 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 that she gave birth to the child. Came in God's appointed time. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, the verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. This is the world's greatest mystery. God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. The world's greatest mercy. God providing a saviour. And here's the word's view. When he said, I am come, we can say, well, this is a great message. Glory to God. It's a miracle because he was born of the Virgin Mary. It's a mystery because he's God in the flesh. We accept him as God's son. And it's a mercy because he's our saviour. And that thrills us. I was coming out of the bathroom tonight. I was thinking of a, the word joy that's hanging in the back of our bathroom door. J-O-Y. Jesus. Taken up with him first. Others next. And yourself last. But Jesus in the center. First and second and third. The words for you. I am come. Now I want you to think of this. As we finish. A winsome view. Of Christ's coming. Look, look at the latter part of the text. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace in the earth. I tell you nay. But rather division. Look at verse 49. For it links up. I am come to send fire. On the earth. And what will I? If it be already kindled. Now, now what does that mean? Mark 10.34 says, think not that I'm come to send peace in the earth, but a sword. Of course, not a literal sword, I have to tell you that. A, a, a spiritual sword, a, 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 a metaphorical sword. Now what he's saying is this as we close. The presence of the true Christ in the world separates and divides. The preaching of the true Christ separates and divides. You see, when, when Christ is present... And in power at work. And when the preaching of the cross is presented. What does he do? Through the preaching of the cross. He draws men and women unto himself. He said if I be lifted up. I will draw all men unto me. And as he draws his own to himself. He separates them from the world. They're called Christ ones. That's where we get the name Christian from. You see, the presence of Christ, the preaching of the Christ, it causes a division. And the Lord Jesus Christ in his personal work causes a division wherever he goes. And when you preach the real message of the Bible, there's going to be a confrontation because of the truth. People are going to say, but that's your view. And we have to say, no, that's the word's view. And there's a difference And the confrontation is because of the truth as it's found in Christ. And I want to say tonight, there's no harmony. There's no true peace in the world uh, apart from the truth that's found in Christ. And where the truth is presented and preached, there'll be conflict. There'll be confrontation. There'll be a challenge. See, we've got to look beyond the physical and look to the spiritual. There'll be those in the world who refuse the truth. They'll resent the truth. They'll reject the truth as it's found in Jesus Christ. I said this morning, 51% of the population in the United Kingdom, at least according to a survey, if we take the entire population, based on the findings of the survey, the percentage that the Christmas story, the Christ child, Thy holy child Jesus has no relevance to them. Isn't it amazing how men and women can be zealous for loads of things? Sport and food and and holidays and everything else. But they're not zealous about Christ. They're not zealous about the gospel. They're not zealous about the truth. Isn't it amazing in the church to know that in this past 50 years, 
The ecumenical spirit has been at work. The, the aim of the World Council of Churches is still the same. They want religious unity. Let's all come together, whatever our denominational backgrounds, whatever our doctrinal beliefs, whatever our religion, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, Christians, let's all come together and let's be united together in the love of God and Christ. I want to tell you, that's not the teaching of the Bible. Because Jesus hasn't come to bring a political or a social peace. A personal peace, yes, but not a political and social peace. There's a division because of him. In fact, the Bible tells us that in John 7, there was a division because of him. Those in Christ and those not in Christ. Are you in Christ tonight? You see, there's a division in the home. Those who are saved and those who are not. There's those divisions in the congregation, those who are genuinely saved in Christ and those who are still sadly without Christ. And at the end of their day and death, there's still the division because the destinies of men will decide where they'll spend eternity. Where will you spend eternity? Here's the winsome view of Christ. He has come into the world and by his presence and by his power there's a division. And it's all because of him. It's all because of his truth. And we've got to accept that. We could talk tonight about the sword and his birth. Remember Mary was told the sword shall pierce thine own soul also. We could talk about the sword in the Bible. The Bible's called the sword of the spirit think of the wonderful words that he speaks and the words that he speaks can wound to bring about healing he's speaking to me many times as he spoke to you and you've been anxious you've been concerned you've been burdened you've wanted to be saved that's the sword of the spirit at work in your heart and mind we can think about the sword in the battle romans chapter 8 uh, can anything separate us from the love of God was in Christ? And one of the things that he mentioned is the sword. And the church is being persecuted. And the church will, will continue to be persecuted. But even the sword of wrath that's against you, even the sword of the government that's against you, can't separate you from the love of God which is in Christ. And what about the sword and the benefactor? Remember in Zechariah 3, awake, O sword, against my shepherd. There was a call for the sword to smite the shepherd. The sword of God's justice and wrath has already struck Christ. It plunged into the very breast of the Saviour. And as the hymn writer says in hymn um, 100, Jehovah bade his sword awake. O Christ, it woke against thee. Thy blood the flaming blade must slake. Thy heart its sheath must be. All for my sake, my peace to make. Now sleeps that sword for me. It brings us to the cross. Can you see that? The, the sword at his birth. And right through the life of Christ. Until his very death. There's division. That's all because of him. The winsome view of Christ's coming. I leave this text of scripture with you. I would love to have had more time to open up this subject. But, but it is relevant to today. We need to, to know what's happening in the world. We need to know the world's view of Christ. Keep that in our mind. We need to hold and contrast the world's view. And we need to remember there's a winsome view. He came. And by his very presence and preaching, he creates a, a division. A necessary division to the glory of God. May the Lord take these few thoughts and bless them to our heart.